Tonight's theme is your greatest learning challenges. It's the end of the year, and we're just kind of opening it up for people to ask um, any sort of questions on anything that they find challenging in terms of learning the Irish language. Um, and happily, I have Bite Size Irish's learning content developer with me tonight. So Neil puts together our online course on our online learning platform. So we do these live Q and A's here and we have our blog and our newsletter and a number of free resources, but we're also um, a membership, um, uh, an online learning platform with a variety of different types of memberships. And Neil is the person who puts together the courses um, that are on those various different memberships. So in a way, um, a lot of the challenges that people um, might have in terms of learning Irish, it's Neil's job to consider those and to come up with tools that learners at different um, stages of their learning uh, journey find useful in terms of learning. So just before we start, Neil, would you like to tell us about a few of those different elements and that learners can find in Bite Size? Sure. Well, we have uh, different courses, uh, online self-study, self-paced courses, um, different levels available at, for, in different memberships. Um, but uh, one of those is foundations level where we have um, the more basics of Irish. So um, how to get started on your Irish learning journey and uh, first get into grips with the absolute basics where there's a special course on just learning how to introduce yourself in the simplest way. And there's other introductions to the basic features of Irish that you will need before you can progress on. And after that, we have um, to SMI, which means a good start. And this is our proper beginners level um, course, which is it, which is a quite in-depth one. It's 10 modules long and it covers a lot of material. It's not just the absolute basics. Um, and following that, we also have Shulach Shkelach, and which is more our intermediate level course. It's our highest level course, probably, so far. And it's uh, it's five modules in. The plan is for ten eventually, but we've got five available at this moment. At this point, and Shulach Shkelach is pushing it a bit further for people who've studied a little bit more, so they can get more practice and get into more. Uh, more of those details. But alongside that, we also have the Ashta Reference Pack, which is um, not necessarily a, a course, but as, as we said, a reference pack. We've got lessons and modules on different topics like dialects and uh, initial mutations and some grammar points. And the idea is that you'll probably want to be coming back to these um, this reference pack again and again as you're studying through or working or practicing on your own, you can almost pop back in and have a look here and uh, you get quite hopefully clear, but certainly uh, quite streamlined um, basic information about these really important things. So that's most of our courses that we have. There's a few bonuses as well, of course. Um, but aside from just the courses, we, we have um, other other services as well, I'd say, Ben, um, to help people learning Irish, don't we? We do indeed. So we have Pubble, which is great because that's a community for learners where you can um, you can exchange your ideas and your frustrations with fellow learners from all around the world. And Emma, our community manager, posts daily um, challenges and she has themes for each day of the week. Um, where she kind of gives you a little bit of motivation to um, engage with different types of uh, elements of learning, learning in different ways, learning um, about different elements of the language and using different topics just to draw you in um, and give you that little push for the day um, to get started. And you can interact with other people, of course, too. That's it, yeah. So there's a nice little community there. Um, and um, of course we also have our live sessions as well so we have two of these um one is for grow members and that's a weekly session which i host on tuesday evenings at eight irish time and that's scripted conversation role play and um, so you get an opportunity to um first of all prepare for it by 
uh, reading a script and looking at a pronunciation guide video. And then you get to practice that role play um, with your uh, partner, um, a fellow learner with my size, a fellow member. And then we come together and we consider um, different elements of the grammar and the vocabulary that are contained in those. So they're quite nice. Um, they're loosely themed um, on the topics that Neil covers in Thusma, um, that course there. But when I'm writing the scripts, I also, I think that if you can find uh, a topic where you can imagine a very natural conversation about something, then you draw a lot of, um, let's say, severs or wealth into it. Um, if you can imagine the characters who are speaking, rather than necessarily starting at a point where you're saying, oh, well, I want to cover this tense or I want to have this particular question type. If you let the thing kind of have a life of its own, it can go in places that you didn't expect. So you can come up with some quite interesting learning points that way. Um, and then sometimes it's done in a more focused way. So that's I think that's an exercise that people find um, useful. And of course, that's not just for um, our GROW members. We also have a monthly session for our EXPLORE members, which is another um, more basic membership, let's say. There's, it's the middle. Um, of our three memberships and uh, we do that again on Tuesday and um, starting a little bit earlier there and that's that's a nice gently paced and um, more simple session that people seem to find very useful um, as they're they're starting out um, so yeah Ashtar is the name of that course there um, with the various different elements that um, Neil described so why do we call this one Ashtar Neil? Well, the word Ashtar means journey. So uh, learning a language is very much like a journey because it does take a long time. Um, and it's it's day by day, it's one step by step by step uh, on your journey. So it's not a quick fix, all finished in 10 minutes. It It's uh, an ongoing thing, which is why um, we at Bite Size, we, we love our motto, Gaelge Gachla, Irish every day. So, if you uh, put one foot in front of the others, practice a little bit of Irish every day, you will make ground on your Irish language journey. And of course, there's also that progressive element of it as well, in the sense that you have your foundation course, and then between there and Shulach Shkielach, there's definitely a progression in terms of mm -hmm. learning and complexity. Um, but the thing that I like about it is that it is bite-sized, that things are explained in plain terms that people can understand. So it's a very user-friendly um, uh, platform to learn on. Um, so uh, just to say, before we go any further, we have a number of questions that have come in um, over the last week. But if you'd like to send us your questions during the session, you're more than welcome. Um, in fact, we'd love it. Um, we have the chat bar there on YouTube. And you can also um, leave messages on the Facebook and uh, comments there as well. Um, and of course, if you're watching this back at some stage in the future, it's never too late to send us a question. We check these things on a weekly basis. So if you have a query that isn't covered in the live session, then let us know and we'll do our best to help you. Um, so Neil, let me just start with one of the questions that came in. During okay. The week. Uh, that's okay with you. So we'll start with Dennis. Um, thank you, Dennis. And uh, Dennis says, his main challenge in learning is understanding um, Irish speakers. So vagaries in pronunciation, speed of speech, and a fear on Dennis's part of coming off as a dolt in terms of um, not wanting, let's say, to ask people to speak nis mwile, no irish, so more slowly or to repeat themselves. So what advice do you have there, Anil? Well, there's a few things, of course, but I suppose number one is that you're not coming off as adult if you're a learner and you don't understand everything immediately, of course. And people don't, aren't so judgmental either, really. So asking someone to speak more slowly or to, to, to repeat um, is fine, really. And I don't think anyone's ever put out by that, really. Um, so that's 100%. Um, okay. Um, 
of course, we, we all have that anxiety, don't we? Um, with the language, certainly, but also with other things about starting out at a skill, something new when you're not as good as the other people. We'd all have imposter syndrome or something, or am I really right for this? Will I ever be able to do it? All of those little voices. Um, so I know it well myself, don't worry. But um, uh, we, we shouldn't let that stop us um, from from taking part. There's there's always a little bit of fear, anxiety, but the people you were talking to, I don't think they would be um, put out or anything if you, if you asked them to repeat or to speak more slowly. So that's number one. Yeah, you you would agree with that, Ben? Absolutely, yeah. And it's good to maybe try and put yourself in their shoes and think about yeah. somebody who's come, let's say not even from a European country, somebody maybe has come from, you know, well, it doesn't really matter where, but somebody is obviously doing their best to learn uh, whatever language you speak, English, for example. You can see they're doing their best. You can see that their ability mm -hmm. has its limitations, but you're not going to you know, dismiss them or get frustrated. You'd be encouraging. Well, I hope you would be anyway. <laughs> I think they are, because maybe even more so with Irish, because anyone that you'll hear speak in Irish has a real gra for the changa. They're someone who loves the language, mm -hmm. usually, I think nearly always. So if you're trying, if you're having a go, they'll love that too. And they'll be so impressed and they'll want to help you. So mm -hmm. that's that's the first point there I wanted to say to that one. Um, but as well as that, as, as Dennis said, you know, listening to confident speakers is not necessarily easy. You know, um, it, it always feels like with a language you don't know, it feels like they speak so fast, you know. But I think that's always just a factor of, how well you know a language. When you know a language well, it doesn't sound fast anymore. It's my theory anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dennis mentioned pronunciation can vary from place to place. And, you know, there's just a local accent and dialect and all of these things coming in. We don't all speak in the same one way, just like we don't in English, just as Ben and I are not right now. Um, but it's still the same language and we can understand. But for the beginner, for, for the starter and people at the earlier stages, that's quite challenging. And, um, you know, I, I remember people giving advice saying like, oh, just listen to Radio Nagartakta, just listen to Radio Nagartakta, as if it was the easiest thing on earth. But Radio Nagartakta is a, a radio station for Gaeltak people. It's not designed for learners at all. So mm -hmm. it is not really set up for that, but it's a fantastic resource. And still stick it on, you'll get something from it. Um, so part of it, it's about knowing uh, your level as well. So when you're practicing, practicing at your level, and um, sorry. Um, um, yeah, so practicing at your level and, and getting lots of listening practice because, um, yeah, we, we do pronounce words slightly differently from place to place. We just need to get used to that the way we're used to it in English, let's say. Ben is from Kerry, I'm from Tyrone, opposite ends of Ireland. And then there's so many other English accents around the world. We know each other because we, uh, or, sorry, we understand each other because we practice, we listen to other accents and we, um, we're familiar with that. So that's uh, one of the other things that we could do, um, more listening practice. Um, so whether it's just uh, using your, your course materials at home, like some of Bite Size Irish materials, we have a lot of audio recorded there that's unique. Um, radio, as I mentioned, or podcasts. And uh, of course, the TV as well. Often the visual element is really helpful, I find, because uh, a lot of communication is visible. It's it's um, a lot. Uh, it's a bit harder to talk on the telephone in a second language because you can't mm -hmm. see them. So, you know, so TV is great for that too. TG Kahar and other you know other video sources, social media, and in person if you can. So the more chances you get to listen to Irish speakers and understand them, the better. So that could be practice from your books, from real life. Or from other sources in the media. Very good. So yeah, we have 
and resources that we come back to time and again that it's good to remember are at hand um, and you have four different dictionaries there um, and um, folklore.ie is the most recent English Irish dictionary and they both have pretty good pronunciation guides as well um, particularly for nouns and then in all of the dialects and audio files to listen to as well of course indeed yeah and then fuimina.ie and abra.ie again are pronunciation guides to very different types really one is synthetic and one is a database of uh, recordings of speakers from the uh, three areas where the major dialects are spoken and then of course as neil was saying uh, we have bite-sized irish as well we have the sound element is a strong element of the the platform as a whole so Gormaga the nail thanks for that so um dennis was talking about understanding and then the next question that we have is about um really finding the opportunity um to have actual conversations in irish so these are two separate questions or two separate um sort of messages that came in from two different people peggy and faye but essentially the theme is the same um asking how can i practice actual conversation in irish i have trouble understanding the spoken irish and being um able to respond quickly yeah so this, this is obviously relevant to Dennis's question as well, really, it's continuing on. Um, so I suppose the biggest issue for a lot of people at first, um, even if you're in Ireland, and a lot of Irish learners are not, but even in Ireland, people have that question of who can I practice with? So it's a an eternal question, but there are people out there, there are ways to make that happen. Um, so that's the first step i think is to to find some people to practice with um of course in bite-sized irish we have a community pubble we have an online community where people meet up um on the message board but we also have those live sessions bio where mm -hmm. people are actually practicing together um through video calls but other things as well you know pop-up gale talks are just um um meetups where people speak irish together and there's other um, if you're around the world in Irish centres or cultural centres like that, there could be um, uh, other events like that too. And, you know, very often there's going to be other people just like you who need somebody to practice with. So if you've got somebody, if you're in Cincinnati or somewhere, you might meet one or two other people in your city who um, who would also like to do that. So you can make a little group together and practice with mm. Um so that's the first thing of course is is finding some people finding a little tribe of course yeah and, and you know, on that, yeah Sorry, on that, like, in, in most um large cities abroad um you'll find that there's a facebook group for you know irish in lisbon irish in paris irish in brussels or whatever it has to be we and invariably if you get stuck in there and have a look down through it you'll find that there's an irish language group in in some pub in the city and so if you have a look on Facebook, that's a good place to start. Sorry, Neil. Yeah, there. no, no, that's that's a great that's a great tip. There are Irish people in every country in every major city, and um, um, you know, quite often some of them would, they would especially when you leave home as well, you start listening to more traditional music and you start <laughs> finding your graph for the old for the old country in the old ways. Um, and uh but you know uh social media and online groups as well uh, even if you are really remote or if you have access issues and can't travel to these big events um so how can i practice actual conversation with people 100 percent um oh well i often say you can practice with the dog if you repeat your lines but really <laughs> with people with people um so when it comes to practice um Sometimes I think people get a bit lost because they feel like they're thrown into a situation and it's sink or swim, you know. But it's not sink or swim, really. We're going to paddle by the edges in, in the <laughs> where, where the water's shallow and we'll have rubber armbands and everything like that. Um, so when it comes to practice, before you go to the more difficult, really open conversations where people could talk about anything, it's important to do controlled practice. 
So for example, sticking to a script where you're reading a script and you can adapt it, change the words to suit your life, of course. Um, so this is what we use in Bite Size Bio. Ben is developing and looking after our scripts there and running Bite Size Bio. Um, or also just sticking to a familiar topic at first. Of course, the introducing yourself topic, the, those familiar questions about who you are, where you're from, uh, what you do, and describing yourself and your family. Well, that's the most important stuff we all like to talk about. And it's certainly the first thing we all want to talk about before we get on to uh, your favorite ballet or <laughs> other other kind of uh, more obscure opinions. But um, yeah, so controlled practice where you know what the other people and yourself will be talking about. And nothing's going to come out of left field. Even the it could be controlled, not just in terms of topic, but in terms of grammar, in terms of level. So you don't need to worry that somebody will say something very difficult or you'll have to bust out some very tough advanced grammar. So that kind of controlled practice at first is good because you can get confident with that. And the thing is, if you feel like I know how to say this, you still probably need to practice it because you want it to feel natural and you want it to feel really comfortable like an old pair of slippers, you know, you just, because when we chat in English or if you're Leafa and you chat in Irish, you don't really think about what you're saying. It just sort of comes out naturally like that. And it's not any effort. So we want those familiar topics to be so familiar, you know, like an old pair of slippers like that. Beloved, mm -hmm. of course, beloved, mm -hmm. but very comfortable. And um, uh, they just feel like part of your body, I suppose. Um, so the controlled practice is really important. So you're so comfortable in that. And then when you're comfortable, you're feeling ready to push out and do something extra. Yeah, so I suppose with that um, part of the challenge there, what you want to be trying to do is to find somebody who is at roughly the same level as you, because sometimes these Kirko Kora can become a thing where somebody who is fully fluent is almost like a teacher. And, they, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more like a lesson than a conversation. But if you're working with somebody who's the same um, level as you or a little bit more advanced, um, you can learn a lot from them um, if they're happy to cover that material again, which they probably will be because they're still, um, still uh, like you say about the old pair of slippers, you know, happy to, to be practicing that. But you can get some good tips on pronunciation from people who are just maybe a step above you there as well um so that's yeah that's that's something to bear in mind if you can find somebody who's at red roughly the same level as you there so then and um, what do you do next after you've broken in slippers where do you go from there neil i think my metaphor might fall apart <laughs> you put on your new pair of shoes <laughs> put on your socks <laughs> um so we talked about the controlled practice where you know what's going to come up um but if you want to be more natural and to really know language, we need to expand from that point. Now, rather than just throwing you into a political debate, we take the, those early things that you have and you can vary them, change some details. You could take on the role of a character and say, well, instead of where do I live and what do I do, think about um, a famous person. What does Bob Dylan or David Beckham, where do they live? What do they do? And so on. Um, just apply the things you can say about yourself to other people. You'll have grammar that you're practicing there because instead of I, 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 it might be he or she or they. And uh, there'll be vocab that you're practicing because they have different details, different job title to you possibly. Um, and uh, so you're expanding slowly there, but it's still a lot of familiar stuff uh, in that area, you know, instead of, I live in Dublin. It could be Tashe in in London. He lives in London. Tashid in Agoni Sanastrail. They live in Australia. So the whole structure is the same, but these little variations means I'm getting a lot of practice for other things. And then if somebody throws a question at me later about where they live, oh, I've actually practiced that. Tashid in Agoni. 
you know, instead of only practicing Tame and Mahoni. Mm. So expanding from the that 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 core of what you do know and varying things, adding a little bit more as you go. Absolutely. So remember, children, you may bore people if you only talk about yourself. So. There's a lot of nice party <laughs> games, aren't there? Like, uh, you know, guess who I am, 20 questions, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So you, you can do that, you know, mm -hmm. take on, play a game with your friends. You know, I've got a famous person in mind. You'll describe their life and they have to guess who it is. So you're having a bit of crack yeah. too. Oh, no, 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 no. And then of course, at the end of the day, there are no quick fixes. So just doing a little bit every day. That's it. So yeah. you got flow. that's our motto at Bite Size. And it's, uh, yeah, it? and I think you just find slowly that uh, it comes together and you add a little bit as you go and then Sometimes people hit a point where you think, oh, I just said that. And a few months ago, I, I would have had no idea how to express this in Irish. So it comes over time. Um, mm -hmm. So again, folks, just a reminder that um, we're live on YouTube and on Facebook here. Um, the theme tonight is your greatest learning challenges. So any um, and every question on that uh, topic is welcome. And we'll keep an eye on the, the comments bar. So we have a few questions that came in earlier. So we just move on to the next one there. Um, Neil, and this is from Sean Johnson. So this relates to um, conversing with native Irish and other speakers in person or online and the challenges that that may present for Sean. So again, a similar theme here. Yeah, well, um, I suppose by seeing native Irish, I almost feel like Sean's talking about the next level up from what we just said before. But it's the same thing, isn't it? Um, yeah, there are, you know, when you're chatting to people, uh, if you're not confident, it'll feel hard, but we can get around that. People are not nice and people are happy to help generally um um uh, but uh you know again as uh, speaking you're kind of performing in front of people so it's different to just looking through the book and answering some questions for example so often you're, you're on the spot really aren't you and sometimes when people turn to you and say hello how are you in irish you might just go blank even if you've said it a hundred times in class in the in that moment you might uh, freeze a little bit Mm -hmm. So it can be a bit daunting, and uh, when something is as big as that, it makes sense to to break it down, to make it bite size, you might say. So again, uh, like before, we mentioned controlled practice, and uh, also free practice as well. When you get to that um, more advanced level, so um, yeah, so that's the controlled practice again is when you're pretty close to a script you know everything that's going on and nobody's going to say something random that's too difficult or challenging right now or people have agreed upon that you know um yeah working with the script or agreed upon topic agreed upon a level not too broad the right level for you all of that so it should be nice and comfortable the right kind of challenge for you mm -hmm. and um so as ben was saying having people at your level is great because you'll get you'll, you'll both get a lot out of that um, but going beyond that then, you know, if you're uh, trying to open up a little bit more, um, we mentioned free practice, and this is less controlled, less scripted. And often when we're doing this, if we take it as practice in language learning, the emphasis is more on fluency, you know, so literally flowing, sounding natural, the way you talk, the way your sentences feel, and communication, you know, just saying the right thing back and being able to ask the right questions and, you know, you're both laughing at the same things or you're able to communicate. So the emphasis is more on that stuff than having perfect grammar and pronunciation. Sometimes that's the fear that, that, that scares people. Uh, you know, in English, people do not speak with so-called perfect grammar, perfect pronunciation 
all the time. If some little blip happens, nobody stops and storms out of the room. Um, and with something like Irish, most people are learners, really. So, um, you know, when we're chatting, there'll be the old little blip with grammar or pronunciation, and it's okay. So don't be too worried about that. Um, but you will be getting something if we, we, we don't want you to stop and consult a dictionary if you're in the middle of a conversation, you know, or to go and um, keep on trying to repeat a word until you say it uh, correctly because you, you break the flow of the conversation. People, you know, it's uh, it's important to have fun. So you've got license to relax, have fun, have the crack, enjoy the conversation. And then you'll be walking away with a big smile. You'll be beaming because you had uh, you had some fun a scale again. So in that free practice, people could chat about anything. Literally, it's free. So you've got to be ready for that, I suppose. Um, but they're, they're different stages, aren't they? The controlled practice. There's the mm -hmm. study stage is a different thing altogether. But mm -hmm. we're talking about speaking. So controlled practice and free practice. There's a little bit more creativity and uh, involved with that and so when you talk about this free practice neil are you talking about a scenario where a group of learners has come together and they're doing this under the understanding that that's what they're doing rather than somebody who's a learner walking into the pub um, and talking with strangers well they're both free practice really aren't they but it, it sort of depends on how free if uh, if we can uh <laughs> If we can measure freeness, um, it's not an absolute. Um, if it's if it's a, a lesson, for example, uh, and everyone's the same level uh, in the group, or if it's a study group, um, mm. when I say free practice, it might just be off script. It's like, okay, now we're going to chat about food, mm. and you just do what you can chatting about food, you know. But you're all on the same page. But you know, you, you might you've got each other to depend on, and everyone knows you're all studying and. If it's a class, you might have the teacher there who's supporting you um, or your notes. Um, so that's free practice because there's, there's no structure, there, there's no particular script that you're depending on. Mm -hmm. um, but an even freer practice um, is, like you say, going into a pub in Dingle or um, any pop-up Geltacht or whatever it is um, and just living through the Irish language, you know. Mm -hmm that's where it's completely open you know mm. so, um so in a sense, you know, various it, gradations of these things I yeah this is, and i suppose for the learner in a sense it strikes me as being a little bit like um the difference with rock climbing in terms of free climbing and having a rope and um, the one where you're in a group of learners you, you have the rope whereas if you simply walk into the pub you also have to Prepare yourself for the possibility that somebody's just going to try and correct you. Um, whereas in the more artificial situation, everybody understands, you know, mm -hmm. something wasn't quite right and they have a laugh about it. But in real world situations, some people can be very picky um, about these things. And again, does it happen a bit, do you think? I have I've never really seen that. Oh, it does. It does happen in the deep dark world. And it, it especially happens with where dialects cross, let's say. Um, so Yeah, so it could, it could happen as much to me, who is an Ulster speaker, as it would to uh, a learner from France or somewhere, because mm. because I've used the wrong Irish, even though it is a valid dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I suppose it's just one of those things to be aware of. Um, that, that can happen. And you know, that's as much about personalities and egos as yeah. anything else, you know. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, people from the Gael Pact are not automatically teachers of Irish and they, they, we shouldn't assume that they're there to provide us with grammar tips or with, you know, or that, that they're, you know, they're just living their life through Irish. So, and the other thing to say is they don't necessarily speak what would be considered perfect grammar either. <laughs> so, course, we don't in English, you know, where I come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't in English either. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they're not automatically ambassadors for the Irish language. No, indeed. People indeed. living their lives. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, yeah, if it's an if it's a learning environment, then everyone will be very very supportive, of course. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're in the wild, um, if you're on location, um, I think most of the time it's fine, really. I but think you'll have a great time, and you probably yeah. learn loads of things you weren't expecting to learn. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just be yeah, just be ready for that real life situation. That's it. <laughs> um, so yeah Kathleen has a question here this was an interesting one um, and this relates to how we try to find a way other than the international pronunciation um, alphabet in terms of trying to explain the sounds um, of written Irish let's say so Kathleen Gurmagat, Kathleen is the Kesh. Thanks for your question there. When I hear you speak and then see your translation, and I'd say this is based on um, some of our videos or possibly on scripts that we have on the blog um, and little bits and pieces like that. And so she says, when I hear you speak and then see your translation uh, to how it sounds in English, for me, a lot of the time, it doesn't match up. And then Kathleen gives an example. So she says, um, for example, the word "ta" is shown for pronunciation as "thaw." Um, I would pronounce that with the "th" sound, but that isn't how Irish is pronouncing "ta." So, I wasn't quite clear on which language, for instance, Kathleen is referring to when she says, "I would pronounce that with the th sound." Um, so, I, Neil seemed to have more of a grasp of this. And meaning here than than I, so I'll let you address that there. I feel like Kathleen and I are on the same page here because I'm I'm uh, I'm one Ulsterman working with with a bunch of Munster people in bite size <laughs> Irish, so I'm I love the beautiful Gaelic in the moon, the Munster dialect, um, but uh, in English as in Irish, our, our dialects are different. I, I'm from Ulster. We have big influence from Scots, so um, one of the one of the classic jokes about the way Irish people speak English is when they say 33 and a third or something like that. We don't do that in Ulster. And, you know, um, for for something like, I think, you know, which people might characterize Irish people saying, I think. Um, in When I was growing up in mid-Ulster, it was a hink, H-I-N-K, which would they, our friends over in Scotland would do as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the T-H sound for you there again. But... Basically, um, when we try to show the pronunciation of Irish language words, when we try to write that down in a kind of transcription of the sound, it always depends on who's writing it and also on who's reading it. Um, so uh, I'm not sure where Kathleen is from, but maybe she and I are from a similar region and we would read and write things in a similar way. Mm -hmm. So this word, this verb, the most common one of the most common words in Irish. Um, I personally wouldn't write that down, T-H-A-W, myself. Mm -hmm. um, so possibly I agree with Kathleen there, but I think in, in um, my colleague's dialect of English as well as of Irish, that's what happens. So basically, when we're writing down with, with the ordinary English alphabet, the sounds of Irish, it depends so much on whatever dialect of English you have. It's really depending on English. So it's not perfect by mm. any means. Mm. And, um, you know, for that reason, the international system is the IPA. But that is very academic. That's all of these. A lot of them are funny symbols that most of us don't recognize based on the Greek alphabet. So we don't tend to use them so much. So I usually think trust your ears more than your eyes because um, we have audio files in Bite Size Irish and good resources elsewhere like Folklore and Changlin. They have plenty of audio. Trust your ears rather than your eyes um, because if people are using the English alphabet to write out Irish sounds, it's going to be flawed because, you know, we don't we don't pronounce English the same way, so. Okay, so I'm not going to let this go until I have a better understanding of what's going on here. 
Um, <laughs> is it the AW at the end or the TH at the beginning? That well, the reason I think I agree with Kathleen or I understand her is that if I see THAW, um, I would say thaw with that th sound. Like mm. I think mm. one, two, three, mm. thank you, thaw. Mm -hmm. Now that sound is not in modern Irish. Mm -hmm. So thaw, it's not thaw me, you know, nobody says that. I understand what, what, what some people do when they write this kind of TH because it's a broad T rather than a slender T. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's ta rather than ta or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, how, how would you pronounce this verb? <laughs> ta. Ta. Yeah, oh. but that's not the same as when, when the snow is melting. And, yeah, you know, that's, that's true. How yeah. would you distinguish between ta and ta? You know, it, it's so hard oh. to use the English. Oh, bit. Ta. There's not a lot of a difference, I think. Ta, ta. Not a lot of difference there. And um, for me, um, for, yeah. from where, for where I'm from, it's quite so it, it depends on our dialects of English. Yeah. So you're saying ta. Ta. Ta, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe it's yeah. because you've got a more slender sound in the middle there. Te, te. Mm. Yeah, but for, for the word in English, though, for thick as well, would, mm -hmm. do the words thick and tick sound quite similar for you? Mm, thick. No, no. Thick and tick. No. But thick is, is closer to a slender T anyway. Yeah, mm. so... It, it gets quite confusing, folks, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, I I would always take the the written out um, in the English alphabet pronunciations. Take any of them with a pinch of salt. You know, I think we need to listen, listen, listen every time. And personally, I, I always recommend Malam Gaspare, the website Fumana.ie, and Fumana.ie is well, fumina means sounds it's about the sounds the phonology of irish and it's got three columns with the three dialects and it's got a lot of words and native speakers pronouncing these words and it makes it very clear how the dialects differ but also just how slender consonants and broad consonants sound and so on now, you can read the phonetics in the IPA there, the more academic stuff. It looks a bit, looks baffling if you're not used to it. Um, but as ever, you can read that. If, if it helps you, great. But um, always trust your ears, I think. So in Bite Size Irish, we always include audio files uh, to listen to. And it's, it's usually Munster Irish, of course. We have a few um other dialects sometimes but generally speaking monster irish um is 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 predominant in bite as irish lovely gormagat um and then, so just a reminder again there folks um welcome your questions on your biggest learning challenges um and you may just take one more question there before we have a look at the chat so um this one came in from um, Megan, who is a bite sized member, so Megan was simply saying that she needs more practice speaking. Now, she said that she had found someone um, who was living close to her and she was hoping to organize uh, a session, practice session with them. But she was also saying she can't make our live Tuesday night events on bite size, that's the BO practice, and it would be great to have a Zoom meeting or something similar to put people in breakout rooms for practice so i understand that megan is an explorer member and we don't have that feature at the moment um, for explore members but for grow members we do have um tesh kind and this is where members practice with other members in an informal self-led session as opposed to the scripted uh, conversations that we do on tuesdays um so uh they choose a set topic or simply have a chat and that one megan takes place on thursdays at 8 p.m irish time so you may be able to make that and who knows maybe in the future um 
that's something that we might be able to consider for other membership plans. But desh kind of means an opportunity to chat, an opportunity to talk. So we do have that as well. And I suppose the, the great thing about Bite Size Pub, the online community, um, which is where the people, these members and Jesh Kainches, where they've met up with each other and then now they're practicing together in the session. So if you're on Bite Size Pub, you can meet other learners and you can chat to each other. And, um, you know, I've seen people who realize they're in the same part of upstate New York and they think, oh, we're going to meet up for coffee and practice Irish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. The essence of community, isn't it? Actually meeting people and, and things happening organically like that. Yeah. And so that brings us on to somebody who I think does live in upstate New York, and that's Deborah, who's one of our GO members. And she sent us a lovely message for Margaret to Deborah. I think Deborah's only been learning Irish since January, and she has made great progress. Amazing. Yeah. Fairness to her. Yeah. So she says she has so, so many challenges in learning Irish, but because of the bite size platform she can't think of any that she isn't being helped with truly so i think that's tribute um to the bits and pieces message. that you put together on a on a weekly basis neil it's very nice and mm. um, so yeah. she said Remarga, Deborah. yeah she actually said girl meal meal mahagriff but i didn't have the space in the banner for all the meals so the fault to wrote a uh, deborah and um so yeah she longer message she lists the ways i suppose in which um it helps her so she was saying for instance that she'd encountered um a form of the word laurelin in the genitive in the the bio script and it reminded her that um there's a difference when you say gadi or hon um a noun so two different ways of talking about going to something. So that reminds her to go back and to revise that. And then she found that information in the Ashtar reference pack. Yeah, I thought that was a really great example of how to use the Ashtar reference pack, because I think she said she she saw the word Laurelin library in a, in a different form. And she thought, oh, I need what? Why is that in that different form? Mm -hmm. So she went to the reference pack. She referred to the reference pack mm -hmm. and found out, oh, this is the Tishel Ginnajach. And we use it because of X, Y, Z. And, um, you know, so that's, I think that's one of the reasons she's saying where that challenge that she she found her answer within the bite size platform. So, yeah, um, that, that's fantastic for us to hear. Um, so, uh, well done, Deborah. And I hope other people too can, um, you know, try to meet some of their challenges using our resources. Indeed. Yeah. And that's the thing about the reference pack. Um, it it gives you the different um contexts or the di different situations in which uh, the genitive will arise so rather than having to try and internalize all this information um in in one go you can go back and forth as you encounter it and mm. find a reference for what's happening um because it comes up in different ways so she also talks about desh kind to um which we were talking, I was telling Megan about there as well, which she finds useful. And then um, Cougar Mugger is another live session that takes place on a monthly basis with um, Emma. And that's where um, people read from um, a source which isn't, um, they're not told what, what they're going to be reading before they go on. So um, that's quite nice just to come to it blind and to practice reading. Um, from a source that Emma has chosen. So yeah, Grimila Mark with the Deborah. That's that's really nice. Grant. Um so Toshe raising the Q and on Sun. Um if anyone has any questions there, you're welcome to uh, just let us know. Um, I suppose uh, we we could mention a couple of the the uh, great learning challenges that we have seen ourselves. We could indeed, yeah. Um, something that's enduring, but certainly from the very beginning that people find a bit baffling is what to do with all those letters in the way that Irish is spelled. And that's what yeah. I've heard. Yeah. So I, Irish spelling and pronunciation is, obviously to everyone now, is so different to English. Um, not everybody, but most Irish learners come from um, English as the first language. But we've got plenty of other people too. Um, but uh, Irish spelling rules and pronunciation rules are different to other languages. 
So um, that can be very daunting at first. That can be quite challenging at first, of course. Um, what would you say, Ben, to someone who's struggling with that? Well, read and listen at the same time and try and make that connection um, between uh, how something looks and how it sounds. Mm. Um, and I would always say, if, if the bad news is that Irish is so different, it's quite unfamiliar. The good news is that Irish is quite consistent with the pronunciation. Mm. And I, I'm obliged to say it is more consistent than English pronunciation rules. Mm -hmm. um, but so if you see the same letters, they should sound the same way uh, in mm. a different word, usually. Um, so, yeah, it's different, but it's it's manageable. And one of my favorite examples for people when they start out is just personal names, because a lot of them are quite familiar, even in the uh, Anglosphere, you know. So names like Roisin, Siobhan, Sinead um, are well known around the world. Um, um, you know, the likes of Succession had a character called Siobhan. You know, I'm not sure how she was spelling it, but well-known international names these days. But they illustrate Irish language spelling and pronunciation conventions. So we've got good examples, Seamus and Sean and so on. So they will they'll help you going forward for sure. But it's a manageable topic, and we've dealt with it in Bites as Irish. Apart from having uh, audio and pronunciation guides everywhere, we have a specific course about dealing with that too. I do indeed. And then another thing, I suppose, that as people progress, trying to um, move from foundation level to more um, intermediate and upper intermediate, um, trying to identify the stages or the steps. It's not just about learning more grammar. It's about um, being comfortable with forms. It's about learning a lot more vocabulary as you go having the means to do that um, using your time effectively to do that. That sort of thing is another thing that people find challenging, convincing themselves that they are making progress, I suppose, and finding ways to, to test yeah, I that. Think, I think sometimes people, find, people can see the progress a lot more in the very early weeks and maybe in the first course think, oh, I can say lots now after mm -hmm. a month or two. Um, but then, they feel like there's a plateau and I'm not learning anything. But I think really what's happening is that people are becoming aware of how much there is in a language. Mm -hmm. So you are learning all the time, probably faster, but you're also more aware of the, you know, that 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 it's a bit, it's an ocean and it's not just a pond that you're sailing on. So mm -hmm. um, uh, not not to put people off or say that's scary, but it's it feels like you're not making progress at that point. But you are. If you're keeping going, you're making progress for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, where what we've been talking about for, for much of this evening's session, the, the opportunities for ordinary conversation are very valuable because mm. you can't not learn in a situation like that where you talk about actual things. Um, meaningful conversations yeah 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 mm. absolutely Togma, and of course we have a variety of different um, um cheat sheets on different things as well that are useful for people um so you find those on our blog um so our blog is here bite size irish blog so whenever neil does a new course or a new and part of a course um, as part of the launch he generally does a free cheat sheet which summarizes the major elements of that and it's nice because it's totally copyright free it's free to download and to share and to use as a as a learning resource and to send to your friends and all the rest of it um, so just one question there um from on mahunach um, he says any tips for pronouncing words such as Irish or names such as O'Kerran? Um, well, I'm not sure if I got the it's second like one. The there. DH in it, my surname has a DH in it. O'Sheel, mm. you don't pronounce the DH usually. It's in the middle. Um, 
But yeah, th these are longish words and they've got some of the complicated factors uh, of Irish spelling. So they've got vowel combinations that are not familiar, that AO, for example, or the OI or EI that don't sound like they would be in English. And then the consonants, especially with the, the shave root consonants, the DH, CH, D, uh, and the DH again. So um, tips for pronouncing them. Um, uh, well, a word like Iracht is in the dictionary, so you can just look that up and hear it three times from the three different dialects. So if it's just a noun, a word, a verb like that, that's a noun itself. Iracht meaning heritage. Um, you can find that in the dictionary. If it's a, a family name like that one, o o um I'm not sure if that's... Uh, I haven't seen that spelling of a surname before. It might be related to some familiar ones like um, O'Kine. Mm. Um, if you take away the O, it's very similar to O'Kine, which is a Connemara surname, the great writer, Marcin O'Kine, and the name Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E in English, very common there. Um, if it's a family name, that you know, you can find examples of it too, if you want to be sure about that, just searching for it um, online. Uh, but yeah, don't forget the dictionary resources, Changlan and Folklore will give you normal words like that and they'll give you the sound of them you can listen in three dialects and uh, pronounce in the you know you can you can pronounce it in in your dialect of choice thank you for your questions folks and thank you neil for being with us and um, as we were saying is um one sure way of making progress. Um, and if you're interested in having a look um, at what Bite Size has to offer, or if you're wondering where you might start, if you want to either embark or go further on your Irish language journey, then here's a good place to start. Um, Start.irish, we have a little quiz there that'll help you to identify um, a good place for you to start. And of course, just in terms of incorporating Irish into your daily routine, um, we have a free ebook with 10 secrets to practicing Irish every day. So some good tips um, there for keeping you motivated and keeping you on track and um, just to incorporating a little bit of Irish into your daily routine.